we go. Hi, this is Off Planet TV, Randy Moggins, and uh, there is something weird in the air, and that something is uh, very much what we need to talk about. Kara St. Louis is with me, and we're just going to kind of let it rip, because what's going on right now is, as we've kind of described in our pre-show, as being this incredibly twisted metal train wreck that's going on. Kara? Now, hi, Randy. Hey, Randy. hey welcome. <laughs> Yay! Just, you know, it's it's really interesting, everybody who's out there listening, because you have to understand that that Randy and I run separate but parallel streams in our lives, and periodically it's like you reach out and you go, hey, are you still over there? Because <laughs> things are really weirdly happening over here. What's happening over there? And um, I run a lot of stuff by Randy to make sure I'm not hallucinating. <laughs> You know, that I really did hear what I just th thought I heard, and, you know, we both, we went through, uh, I guess I can, no, you know what, Randy and I decided that the gloves are off for this interview, so I went through an interview with Randy, I thought it was a great idea, and we both just kind of went, what is happening here, we kind of, <laughs> we were like, yeah, yeah, we the things. Some bad. and I was like, Randy, Randy, are you there, anyway, um, so we've been talking about how this is, this is all going down and what it actually is since really before Max Spears' death, but that seems to be exceptionally pivotal for whatever yeah. reason, and that's when we pivotal. really started talking, you know. I mean, I know Randy said, and he, he's going to tell me what he thinks now because it's been a couple of months, and in, what we, in, in our business, that's like two decades. So um, he thought it was a shot across the bow at the time. And um, I've had people approach me and say it was an accident. I've had people approach me this, that, the other thing. But the first thing Randy said was it was a shot across the bow. And the reality is, even if it wasn't somehow an accident, okay, it certainly served its – I mean, there was a cosmic purpose in there. Yeah. That you know, it was like a it was like a knife in the gut of the uh, alternative community, and it started things falling and caving in, and people turning on each other, and um, it became a free for all. It became a free for all, and the dust hasn't really settled yet. So what's really interesting, a couple of people just kind of disappeared from the scene. Maybe they'll come back at some point. Um, and a couple of us just sort of hunkered down and, and refused to talk to anybody that we absolutely didn't trust completely until the dust settled. Yeah. Uh, but we also continued to do our work because we have to continue to do our work. Yes, we do. Know? You know, what you're talking about there is we've really been in this whole dark season of disclosure going back to the equinox in June. Mm -hmm. It seems like the page turned at that point, and there has mm -hmm. been just rapid fire succession of disclosures mm -hmm. and ugly mm -hmm. things that have come to the surface. Right. Um, obviously, Max was, was one of the most traumatic because... It really was a warning shot, and unfortunately, warning shots sometimes have casualties. Yeah. And um, this one was big. It rippled across the alternative media in a way that I don't think we've seen before. Never. Mm -mm. I had a parallel event that goes way back to 2012 when um, we were dealing then with somebody who called himself former White Hat, who was... Yeah doing this really abusive blog. Was that Drake? And it was not Drake. It I was, was, I don't know. Um, it was a talk show, radio, radio talk show host named Michael Hemmingson. Okay, I don't know who that is, one. Who is a, who is a um, naval intelligence operative. Oh, there naval you go. Intelligence in and out of Mexico into the United States. He was on uh, Revolution Radio. Yeah. And he denied, denied, denied that he was who he said he was. We did the forensics, everything from IP addresses to writing styles. There is no doubt in my mind. And, and my friend, um, Chris Neal, began furiously exposing him. And yeah. um, as a result of that, um, Chris Neal wound up being suicided. 
Oh, he was MK Ultra. He had a suicide program. Had a suicide button, didn't he? Yeah. And, and a lot of us were concerned about this. And this goes into the current scandal. You know, things have dovetailed through in an amazing way that I would have never foreseen. Oh, no. Kind no. of tragic and personal. And so Chris Neal was suicided out. And about 11 months later, it was announced that Michael Hemmingson, the radio talk show host, a.k.a. former White Hat, somehow in a seriously died in Mexico and disappeared. Oh, I see. Now, this is how operatives work. Yeah. When they're implanted, embedded operatives become too highly exposed, they take them out, they move them, they take them out of the line of fire. So yeah. Michael Hemmingson is not dead. He's simply gone somewhere else to do another op somewhere else under another flag. Right. Chris, right. Uh, Chris Neal is dead. And, and um, that came back as a result of the succession of things, which was Max Spears' death and the revelations about Donald Ferguson, a.k.a. Zen Gardner. Yeah. Who was forced out himself. You know, let's be fair about this. Don knows this. Everybody else knows this. He didn't have a choice in coming out and revealing that he was involved with right. a 1970s child pedophilia sex cult. Right. That he had hid for 10 years in plain view on the Internet, operating as this love and light guru related to David Icke and Jeff France and all these other high-profile people. And the fallout from that was profound. Um, I ultimately wound up in a huge battle with my former network. I left, I left three weeks before um, the revelations right. about Zen Gardner. Right. And I warned those people with the network then this was going to bite them in the ass. Mm-hmm. And when it came out and when I did the one thing that I did do in response, I wrote one article mm -hmm. where I also exposed yeah. some things about myself. You put that and, on Facebook, didn't you? Absolutely. <laughs> and that actually, oddly enough, you know, I'm not much of a blogger and my <laughs> blogs generally don't get a lot of hits. That one got 3,000 hits on my website, which is probably, oh, probably in the website yeah. not by itself. But the interesting thing was, CCN, Conscious Consumer Network, then turned around and did a two-week slam campaign on me for one article that I wrote. There you go. Slammed yeah. me, yeah. libeled me, brought in this character named Z, who was, for a short period of time, as you know, part of my orbit. I got rid of him. Mm -hmm. and they brought him in. Oh, him? No, they brought him in. I didn't oh, yeah, they that. brought him in. Because they don't pay attention to anything they do because they slammed me months ago. Well, of course not. But it know? was a well-planned, you know, here's a guy who's out there. He's got oh. thrown up his ass for me because I threw him under the bus, justifiably so. He's a, he's a cult leader. Yeah, yeah. And he basically came out in a show that he did on CCN and said that I was responsible for the death of Chris Neal. So, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. You not only right. get to lose a friend, right. but then, you know, tangentially somebody accuses you of being complicit in that. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. that's the first time that I've dumped publicly about all of this. But what's really going on is just this whole purging process. It is, and this goes into where I was going to start this conversation with you because I went back yeah. to Dangerous Imagination Oh, At the geez. very end yeah. of that book, um, you talked about something there at the end of the book that was very important, and that is the cleansing of our morphogenic field, the rise of the sorcerer. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's funny because, Karen, I just picked the book up a couple of days ago. It was, it leafed open to this page, and I went, oh, my God, this is totally. There it is, right? Yeah. There it exactly. is. Exactly. There it is. Isn't that funny? You know, we write these things, and, and there's so much that comes through us. Yeah. And then later on you go, oh, my God, I had no idea we were writing about that, and here it is, and there yeah. it is right in front of us. There it is. That's one of those existential questions about writing. It's like, who writes it? Where is it coming from? You know what I mean? 
Um, one of it becomes the, prophetic. It becomes prophetic because we're pulling counts. out of ourselves. Yeah. One of the few things that Counts Bella ever said in his in his saner, more clear moments was, "We don't write fiction," and I think he's right. We don't write yeah. fiction ever. We write real. We write reality, yeah. and that goes back to you know the imagination and everything. So, well, you know, when you're talking about. Um, you're talking about the issues that you had with CCN and, and the blowback you had with this new character and and um, how it's purging and and I the visual I get when you're talking about that, Randy, is that it's just what we're people like you and I are trying to explain right now, which is that we're kind of just we're we're continuing to work, but in lots of ways we're also sort of you know sitting trying to be very still in a way. Yeah. And and letting it all sort of all of the all of the I mean I don't even know how to, to describe it. You said purging. I thought about vomiting. You know this this. this it is it is vomiting. It is it, it is psychically projectile vomiting. Oh, right yeah, now. the stuff that's flying around us all the time right yeah. now. You know, and 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 knowing because we're old enough to know that this too shall pass. Right, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. You know, not really, but be, like begging for it. Please, God Almighty, let's let this, you know, yeah. settle so that we can move forward, so that we can actually take a look at it and figure out what exactly just happened, you know. I have no – the thing that happened with CCN is mind-boggling. It's absolutely gobsmacking. You know, there were two of us that got trashed by Miles Johnston sort of – like two dominoes for various for different reasons um but after i had all my stuff yanked down angela power disney had all her stuff yanked down you know and so uh, i know of her we're not really good friends or anything but i certainly know who she is and so i sent her a little message i'm like are you okay what's happening what's got what's going on what's happened and so she just said that she had had all her crap taken down and i thought well you know <laughs> Here we go. It's Miles. And then all of a sudden, this woman who who has, well, she's MK Ultra as well. She's the first one to tell you that. She's absolutely, completely honest about that. All of a sudden, she's doing what? An apologia with Zen Gardner? Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, was, I was like, how does this happen? How does this kind of shit happen? Seriously, this is, this is Stockholm Syndrome in all caps. Come on, man. Well, and then there's the whole Hoaxstead thing that's come out where there's this huge gigantic diversion program away from people who were victims of um, child sex abuse, which yeah. is an issue that I'm still wrapping my head around. That was... I was sitting in the background of, of all of this. Yeah, yeah, right. And it's pulled a lot of people into its gravity in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, at some point you have to look at this and you come to the conclusion, well, fuck, this is a PSYOP. Yeah. And we were in the midst of it the whole time. Yeah. And it's kind of like, look, that's not my first rodeo. I've been through this. I've been through this with networks. I've been through this with programs and operatives and agents and all of the assholes that are out there floating around since right. I was a kid, frankly. But what really is happening is there's this gravity well that wants to pull all this stuff in, and it's convoluted, and, and it's very difficult now to tell exactly who is what and who's operating on what side. It's... Well, it's Fifty Shades of Grey on steroids, basically. It really is. It really is. But I've also noticed, Randy, that the one thing, even though in some ways these tangential people, it's very difficult. It can be very difficult. You've got to listen to your body, though. You know that. Mm -hmm. You do it all the time. But there's also a couple people where you're like just, con just automatically back-to-back, -back, you know? Right, back-to-back, -back, Randy. Come on, back-to-back. -back. we got, you know, they're coming from all sides. Yep. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's one of the first things I did. That's one of the very first things I did. So what's up now is um, I have to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and then we're just going to chat about you. Well, you're going to ask me whatever you want to ask me, and then we're going to chat about some stuff. But uh, um, I'm actually in the United States right now, as you know. You know that, right? Yes, I you do know that. Yes, I'm yeah. Yep. Right now because one of my kids is really sick, uh -huh. and um, 
So I'm dealing with that right now. And on top of the fact that um, everybody, you said it tonight, just as I was thinking it, driving down the road. I don't feel anything around me but pure exhaustion here in the States. Absolute exhaustion. My children are exhausted. Mm. This country. This country is exhausted. Dry. It's you know, exhausted. it's so funny you bring that up because I just posted on to Facebook a couple hours ago. I saw, I saw it. I went right. I'm going to stop posting on this election because it is, yeah. it is like leeches on the collective body right now, just pulling the yeah. morphic field down. You know, we've yeah. got... Yeah. We've got Hillary Clinton, you know, is she dead? Is she a clone? Is she a CGI? Was she arrested? Did she collapse? We've got 50,000 different stories about what's going on. We have Donald Trump marauding all over the country. We have people who desperately, they just, honestly, they just desperately want to believe that something can turn this thing around. I've never seen an election like this it's in my It's desperation, life. yeah. And I've never seen anything like this. I understand the fatigue. We have gone through we have gone through one of the now most pronounced economic downturns we've seen since the Great yeah. Depression in this country. Yeah, and yeah. it's yeah. been a quiet depression. The attrition has been profound, but it's been done very quietly. This is right. this is quiet weapons for silent wars that we're dealing with. This is the kind of war that intelligence agencies sit in back rooms and stage out over decades. Exactly. And the, and the American people are in the gun sites right now. They don't know it, and they're perplexed because they don't understand what the flip is happening to them, what's happening to right. their country, and why psychologically they feel disenfranchised. Right. They have no idea. I mean, I've got three kids in early adulthood here, you yeah. know, and I just watch them. And the effects of everything that's, I mean, the effects of the social engineering that I write about. And I'll be damned. First of all, I'm going down swinging, Randy. So are you, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. If I can do anything about it, they're not going to inherit this. They're not. I, no. I'll throw myself under whatever bus I have to throw myself under, which is you know, why I continue to talk right now, because uh, I'm going to continue to work through this. I'm here, you know, um, I'm on unpaid leave. I'm on a sabbatical through January. Then I'm. Through, I'm sorry, through December, and I've got to go back to work, but the reality is, Randy, Randy, I could be here for a year untangling and helping and sorting and healing and all of those things because everybody is exhausted. Everybody is just exhausted, and I'm just very, very lucky that I work in England, which means that my livelihood is protected because the, they're not going to let anything happen to the freaking city of London. You know, that's that's like being because I work in the spy, the center of the spider's web. You know what I mean? I my job is fairly well protected. I can I can throw things back, resources back this way that my that the people I know don't have uh, don't have access to anymore. They just don't have, and they because they're because they're in their early twenties, they don't know they don't know where to turn if there aren't there if there's nothing. And that, it can't, I mean, that's got to be national. It's got to be nationwide. If you're somebody whose kids are doing okay right now, you better thank your lucky stars because I'll tell you what, they're all shattered right now. They're just beyond, they're just beyond exhausted. So, um, but anyway, go ahead. No, even the people that you, you call, quote, doing well, they're not really doing well. They're just more right. cushioned from the effects of this right, right, cycle right. That we've been in. They're not really right. okay. And I know I deal with people at all levels, I'm professional people, very well to do people, educated people, yeah. a lot of people in the right. tech industry. And quite frankly, they're not okay because psychologically underneath there's an undercurrent right now where they're going, there is something wrong. And you know, you get that. When you're empathic, people open up to you. And I get these people, and this is like, you know, it's been the burden of my life and the joy of my life because there's somebody will turn around to me and go, I don't understand. It's like yeah. I finally found safe harbor for somebody that in an unguarded moment 
they could just go, I don't understand. And I've got that it. Is yeah, the happened? door you walk through very carefully, you find that person's particular issue and, and you just you speak to it and you speak to it as a healer at that point. Yeah. Because exactly. it don't need recrimination. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Listen, I have a, a story for you. <laughs> Because it's one, it's one of those stories that just fits in with what's going on right now. I was just in Germany um, and some other places, but this particular, I was at, sitting at a dinner table with some Germans that I know, and they are very much not part of the awakened, shall we say, okay? Mm -hmm. They've got a nice pension and everything's hunky-dory, yeah. and most of them are retired. One of them is still teaching a couple more years. And um, the question of Monsanto came up, and I can't even remember why now. Oh, hemp. I was talking about marijuana and in the United States because, you know, most people in Germany are on, on board with that. That doesn't mm. bother them at all. You know, but I said, I said, yeah, it's a really good thing. I'm very much for it. I'm, I back it. Uh, whoever's doing, you know, the medical marijuana stuff in the United States. But the one thing that we do worry about is that Monsanto is going to get a hold of the patent, blah, blah, blah. And um, this woman, and I swear, I'm going to swear in a minute, cover your ears. But this woman, this woman said to me, that I all, be at that. in all sincerity and in, um, with, a, with a very aggressive smile, well, you know, if Americans would just vote, they could take care of problems like Monsanto. And she said to me, you know, more than half Americans don't vote. Why don't you vote? And I went, Am I hearing this? Am I, am I really, really hearing this? And then what happened two weeks later, Randy? What happened? Which German company bought Monsanto for $66 million, including their private army? Huh? Yeah. So what I really want to do is call this woman up and say, hi, why don't you just vote that away? You know what I mean? I couldn't believe. I could not believe yeah. she had. But, you know. There, there are just you, – you have to be in the world, and you have to deal with people who aren't awake at all. So anyway, that's my um, – I can't believe this. One of the I can't believe this is actually happening stories, you know. Um, so let me tell you a couple of things, and then you ask me some questions because I know there's stuff that you might want to talk about. But um, as you know, first of all, I'm just going to put this in your thinker for, for later in a, for, in a minute. But as you know, I'm going to – well. I'm going to see uh, C.W. Chanter tomorrow. I think he's one of my new favorites. We'll see. And um, quite like the guy. I love his sense of humor. He reminds yeah. me of my old son, the way he reacts to everything. I thought, are you from Philly? I thought he was from Philly, but I don't think he is. I think he's from Virginia or something. But anyway, I'm looking forward to talking to him. And one of the things that he wants to talk about in the end now, after a couple of weeks' worth of um, you know, business has gone by, is he would like to discuss – Oh, it is that people quote unquote know things. Okay, fair enough. But you know what? That's just an existential question. You can't really answer that, you, you know, definitively. Um, and okay, fair enough. How do people know things? Well, you know, it's like, did you see, um, did you see the movie Contact? Do you remember when? Um, yeah, Matthew McConaughey asks Jodie Foster, did you love your father? Mm -hmm. She said, well, of course I did. And he said, prove it. Right? I mean, some things you just can't nail down, man. Anyway, um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. And I thought, oh, gosh, because, because, you know, this existential stuff can sometimes just be obfuscating. It can just be distracting. It can just be away from, you know, things that you need to talk about. But then what that led me to, Randy, was this idea – or especially for somebody like me, is how do, okay, fair enough, but how do people, what's more important, the real question is, how do people learn? How do people remember themselves? You know, yeah. it's not necessarily how do you know, it's how do you, how do we now remember ourselves? Yeah? So that's actually something I'd like to look into fairly deeply. Well, how you know yeah. things, I mean, look, there's a whole field of philosophy called epistemology that goes into that. Yeah. And yeah. it's useful to be able to go back and do proofs on things. But a lot of what you and I deal with, Kara, 
is in the realm of the margins of what we call this reality stream. In other words, you're mm -hmm. breaking out things like the Fae and altered timelines and all of the social engineering that's going on, all things that sit behind the backdrop of the academic world and the world that puts things under a microscope, dissects them, and, and then writes these very elegant papers about them. Right. So how you know something in the end comes down to who you are and how you are able to traverse the landscape of where you're at. It's an internal yeah. process. You know, exactly. this goes back to the original thing about what's going on with people and why they're so lost right now. Everything has been externalized. But in fact, we're internal beings in the sense that the landscapes of who we are and what we are is mapped out in here in a very real mm -hmm. sense. And, right. you know, nobody wants that because that's uncomfortable because guess what comes with that? Responsibility. Responsibility. Yeah. Yep. Responsibility, that's yeah. right. Yes, and also what one has um, what one has to back that kind of thing up is um, millions of anecdotal stories, um, but that's not really material science, is it? It's not. Uh, nope. It's not equations. It's not beakers. It's not. Uh, it's not a map on a computer. I mean, I mean, I think that's probably what we'll end up talking about tomorrow. And, and in the end, uh, it is exactly what you're saying. It is. It's internal, and so. And so it cannot be pinned down def definitely. So I think it's a, it is an interesting question, but it's a more important question to consider how people learn, how people remember. And he does have a point, Randy, when he says, look, I mean, he has a point and he doesn't have a point. On the one hand, he's eliminating the hundredth monkey theory, critical mass, which is absolutely real. But parking that over here he's saying look you know you don't have the numbers for the that the kardashians have and you don't have the numbers of you know b people watching you that kind of thing and I, i'm thinking yeah well okay but something what lives in the space between the two of those things is a vital internal energy in our communications with each other your shows you put out my shows i put out how do people you know, connect with those sorts of things. I went and did, um, I did a, a lecture in Vienna, I don't know, six months ago maybe, and on um, government sanctioned child abduction, in other words, social services, right? And the woman who invited me and, and the woman who put the whole thing together, one of the women who put the whole thing together said to me at dinner the night before the convention, um, Kara, Tell the English-speaking population that we're desperate. Tell them that we're desperate. And so I said, I, I promised at that point that no matter who I was talking to or what I was saying, I would mention this, yeah? Um, but one of the guys who was there with me, um, God, now I'm going to forget his name, and it's too bad I did, but he was the attorney. It'll come to me. He was the attorney who was hired by the shipping company in Sweden to investigate that ferry that sank. Um, I'll remember his name, don't you worry. But anyway, he was on the program with me doing um, transhumanism, mind control, things like that. And I had never used a backdrop. I'd never used the, the gigas and the gugas, you know, mm -hmm. because I felt like if I was talking about the imagination, maybe I should just suggest that people use their imagination. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what he said to me was, look, you, this is how you engage their subconscious. And so I also tell people that because I've started using this stuff behind me in lectures and stuff. And I, I tell people that story because I want them to know that the A, that's how easy it is. And B, that that's what's going on when people do that. That instantly they're so trained and, and tuned into that kind of thing. But that is how we engage their subconscious. Anyway, um, I can't remember. Oh, this was about how we learn and how we remember. So I'm doing, because I have this four months, Randy, um, I'm also trying to make it very, very positive 
in lots of ways. And so I'm trying to do a lot of work in the cracks, which is what I tend to do. It's not the first time my youngest son's been ill. Um, so I am, I've started a little show of my own. I call it a little essay program that I call 13. Because 13 is the, name of the number of transformation. And that's all it's called. It's called 13. What it's going to be, I don't know. Maybe I want to pull out 13 points of the false chronology one by one. Maybe, I don't know, it could be whatever. Uh, I, I don't even know what I want it to look like. But the reality is I would like to engage people in the way that they learn and the way that they remember without – do you remember when um, RT first came out and we were all just staggeringly – into RT. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, I can't believe this is fantastic. And then it started to get a little slick. And I went, huh. And then they had Larry King on. Yeah. That was my moment when I went, mm -hmm. no, this is, no, uh uh, no, this is taken over. This is something else altogether. So you want, this is one of the things I'm exploring right now. I'm exploring how we engage people with our material. When we can, if we can, um, visually, I think that uh, one of the things I often write about is that people, that we are mostly nonverbal communicators. It's mostly visuals. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. What do you think? Well, that's actually the struggle that we're going through right now. I mean, and when I say we, um, my co-host and producer, Emily Moyer, and I, we've been having this backtrack conversation what do we want to do? What do we want this to look like? Do we want to be slick? And to some degree, I want polished production, but I don't want it so slick that it can't breathe anymore. Right, right, right. And that's the things that you get into when you're doing a type of media. And then people got to remember, media is something that sits between the viewer, the listener, and the information provider. We've grown up. My generation, especially, forward, grew up with intermediation of, of data and perception, perception right. management, right. all through the one-eye screen called the television, right. which was telling us a vision, but it wasn't ours anymore. And it wasn't imagination. It was programming. They yes. told you that. They freaking right. told you that. We're now back to our next regularly scheduled program. Program, regularly scheduled, regularly program. scheduled program. The eyeball. Yeah, 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 I so, know. You know, it is a difficult thing. We are, we are visual people. I mean, yeah. the act of you and I being on this screen is one level up from you and I just doing an audio talk. Right. right. And I like both medium, and, I, and I've said this. When I first started doing the TV show, I was really uncomfortable with it. I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with my face for two hours? <laughs> Who wants to be on screen that long? You know, and, and, yeah. and in some ways it's always uncomfortable. Yeah, but two hours just goes like that, doesn't it? It does. It does. And you know that. Yeah. But the visual communication of being able to look in the eye to body language, um, <clears throat> maintaining a certain level of posture and poise, but at the same time, being authentic, knowing when to smile, knowing when to drop your face, your look, your eyes. Right. Those are all communication modalities that are important. Right, 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 right. But I think that um, if, you, if you have that inner vitality anyway and you're just generally interested in other people, which you are, and so am I. I just got this. I just got this mess. I'm sitting here. I'm looking. I have a MacBook, and it shoots my Facebook messages across the screen. Get this. <laughs> Facebook. There's this guy named Patty. He's going, Randy. When is this fucking Mercury retrograde over? <laughs> People, right. this is great, you know, because this is exactly what it is right now. Everybody's just going, oh my god, my shit doesn't work. I, I have been through, yeah. as of tomorrow, four routers on my home internet system. I've had to go get new phones because my phone right. was burning me. It was so hot. We, our internet service, it just goes out. You reboot the router, it goes out again. You reboot the yep. router, it yep. still doesn't come up. Yep. Nothing freaking works. Nothing's working. I've been trying to get an interview. <laughs> from, I know. I've been trying to get an interview done with James Swagger for like a week and a half now, and it's just not 
You know what I, I love mean? James, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's the one that gets tanked every time. Yes. And he's like, no problem, no problem. Well, I'm saying, yes, problem. Yes, problem, because he's an expert on the Fae. <laughs> he's, you, know, you know? Yes, problem, James. I'd like to know what you have. This I would like to have this discussion. But the universe doesn't seem to want us to, Mercury does not seem to want to have us to have this discussion. And, you know, it's really funny, too, because there's two things I was going to say. I was going to say a minute ago, I've got this camcorder. I don't know where it is. I'm not going to go find it. But Yashka bought me a camcorder, okay, so that I can do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But hilariously enough, if you watch, have you seen the first episode of 13? You need to look at it. I have not. No, I, you, I, you would enjoy it. It's only 24 minutes. Go look at it. Tell people where they can find that, by uh, the yeah, way. Yeah, it's on Hard True, which is my YouTube channel. Please go. Okay. First of all, oh gosh, now I'm going to say a few more, few more things. I have a YouTube channel, finally. It's called Hard True. Two words. Um, and in there, I'm parking all my my uh, uh, interviews. There's some of uh, Randy's interviews are in there with me, but I'm parking all of them in there because Miles Johnson screwed me over so right. so badly that I'm now parking you know my interviews someplace where I everybody can, needs to own their own content. You've got to own your own important. content, right? Yes. Anyway, um, yeah. So that's what it started out to be. But then I thought, you know, I I really need I need to talk to people. I I need to talk to people. And at first I thought it's going to be bizarre that I'm not talking to a person. It's just, you know, me talking to a camera. But you know what, Randy? You know me. Once I start talking, the problem is shutting me up, whether I'm talking to a camera or whatever. Anyway, the funny thing is, I mean, my, my daughter helped me um, edit it. I guess it was last week. You got to watch it all the way to the end because she said she did some of the best stuff with it. But the funny thing is, and we're talking about being yourself and just enjoying, you know, this what you're doing is that I will always, 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 always have to reach around to the back of it to turn it off after mm -hmm. the interview. And so people just get a nice shot of my nostrils. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> exactly. But I only warn them. And I'm thinking, this is my signature, Randy, because I've said, I will always have to do this. Here I come, you know. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so. So, yes, I have a channel. 13 is on there. I'll be doing various stuff on that. I need Randy to stop by and give me a little bit of a critique on it. And I don't even know what I want it to be. I'm thinking I'm going to grab my camcorder early in the morning. I'm near the shore. Maybe I'll just go sit on a rock and talk about something, you know. But really, it's about um, enlivening. We always talk about that. That's our business, Randy. We, I just said it. It's about enlivening this, all of mm, this. Yeah. Is it not? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we can do it, and that's our job. So um, is that the only thing I wanted to say to you? I just got an inter I just got an invitation to go speak in San Francisco in December, which is, which awesome. is kind of cool. Cool. Maria Wheatley, do you know you do know Maria? I've I do know who she is. Yes, and, okay, and you know who she is. Yeah. she and I are actually writing a book together. It's called um, "Guardians of Blood and Fire: The Search for the Celtic Heart." And um, so we're going to Ireland uh, first week in November to to dig around because she can get me into places I could never even find that I would never know even existed. Mm. You know, so we're going to go check that out. And then at Rudolf Steiner House in February, she and I are are uh, lecturing on the 24th we're halt, we're having our very own just, just the girls just me and maria um and then in april i might be going back to australia but we need to talk about you remember we've talked about australia a little bit we yeah, should talk yeah. about that because i'm sick and tired of this okay i'm sick and freaking tired of people trying to take us down personal I mean, I had people, there's a, there, I guess I should say that there is a major troll in Australia who's been after me for four years since the minute I hit, and for a long time she was after me by, by running me around the block, so I, I never really got anywhere, And then, but once I actually got there, oh man, oh man, did she go after me, and I'll tell you something, Randy, you know how I know it's as black as it is? I was at Starseed in Byron Bay, and I was just taking the stage, and that is when she started her shit on their on the page that went with Byron Bay. It was coincident yeah. to me hitting that stage. She started. 
that's black. That's black magic. I'm sorry, yeah. but that's how yeah, that it was. That's just, that's, that's just. Did you, you know, know, I watched all this because I somehow wound up in the middle again of this shit stem, yeah. you know, with this person telling me, Kara St. Louis is, is spreading all this information about the Fae. It's a giant cover story for AI. That's all the Fae are is AI. And, and, and I'm, so here we go. You know, yeah. how do you know what you know? What are your sources? This person right. has no sources. They're quoting one article written by somebody else who I don't respect. Right, right. It was Robert Morning's guy, right? I mean, is that, that was the guy? They sent yeah. me this, this. These articles, you know, this is like moldy bread stuff that's been around on the Internet for years. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so, it was bad enough that someone actually contacted me and told me I should hire an attorney and sue her to shut her up. It was that bad. But I actually just immediately, I didn't want it in, I didn't want it in me. It was no. aimed at me. I didn't want it. So I blocked her and went away from it and, and let other people kind of try to catch it and yeah. deal with it. And several people in Australia did try to do that. Um, and then finally one day, after so much of the shit had gone on, I, I posted on Facebook that apparently there is a growing cadre of attorneys dealing with this kind of stuff um, and hoped that, because she had people watching my page, you know, of course she did, because I blocked her. That's called gang stalking, Randy. And uh, I'm hoping it would get back to her, and it, it got very, very quiet, and then the Ken O'Keefe thing broke, and she went bananas on Ken O'Keefe, and that kept her... I don't know. Maybe it's still keeping her busy. But I don't know. I it makes me. Um, I'm not in this to do to have my energy and my life and my work sucked dry by a troll. I'm not. I I won't sort of say go to Australia so I can joust with this woman. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I won't do it. I'm going to get some work done, and so I have thought about having. Um, I mean, there were five or six places I was invited. I've thought about just going to Melbourne and Byron Bay again because they're and making it invitation only to my particular. I thought about doing that, and I don't think that that's cowardice. I think that that's get the fuck out of my way and let me work. I'm not going to – I just don't want to spend my energy – Tangling with you because that's what you're there to do is make me spend my energy tangling with that you. is the point of all of it even on the YouTube trolls you know the character assassinations that go on I mean look yeah. you know, I was told directly by people close to me what was going on with CCN after I left I didn't watch any of it right I still have never watched all but about 10 minutes of one of those interviews right, right. I never saw what they did when they put Z up I didn't listen, and my comment back was simply this. If I get sucked up in this, it will consume me. It will consume my energy. It will dilute my power. Uh -huh. And quite frankly, I don't need to defend myself. I've right. been doing this when these people were still puking green. I mean, exactly. quite frankly, I have enough of a legacy on the Internet, and en enough people who have met me know me. Yeah. I don't need to defend myself. Right. You just keep going. Yeah. People, people have short memories. And also, I do. And that's. Years, I've learned in the last couple of years that most people don't catch this shit as it goes by anyway. No. And you just keep going. I mean, look at what I. It just, to, just as an example, how I, I know, because I used to work for him, how much negative crap gets thrown at Ike. Whether he deserves it or not, he just walks past it because he yeah. knows. Most people aren't going to see it anyway. It's just going to fly off into space. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if he just keeps going, making millions and whatever, right? Anyway, um, yeah, so, so I don't know if I'll go or not. I've got to fundraise it. I don't know. We'll see. I'd like to go again. I have to tell you, I have accepted, and we'll see how it goes. I, I did try to do a show for CCN, but it was such a dismal failure, and I hated it so much. <laughs> From the beginning, it was like, oh, this feels like being, you know, tarred and just, ugh, I can't do this. Um, so I just walked away from CCN, and I thought, I don't know if I'll ever do that again. But James Swagger on Capricorn Radio is looking for partners, which I've already said to you in case you're interested in some kind of a house, you know, for your house. Um, 
Yeah. No, I'm going to start, I think, on the 9th of October. I'm going to try. It would be 11 a.m. Saturdays, okay? And we'll see what yeah, it's like. So it's going to be a network, and, and I'll just say this, because I, James and I go way back. Uh, when you he published, know him? Oh, my gosh, yeah. When he I published his know. first book, I was one of the first people that interviewed him. He was on Off Planet Radio back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, a couple of times he popped in on my show. He'd be on the chat room and he'd come in. I, one night I didn't have a guest. Guest bailed on me. And James pops up and we do 45 minutes talking about his trip down to Peru and the ayahuasca thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Very spontaneous. And so, I mean, I got to say, if there's any place where I would probably feel at home, it would, it, it would be there. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Of, you know, for right now, the challenge has been to try and do something a little more independent. And it's not against anyone. I know. Um, You've got to find out. You've got to find out if you can do it on your own. Yeah. You've had to. I and, mean, it's and, one thing, you know, I'll be honest with you. Miles Johnston drove me crazy 60% of the time, okay? But he had such a huge audience, and he was so receptive to what I was saying that I was just like, yeah, I can cope with this for now. I can cope with this for now. I haven't seen anything particularly, you know, shady yet. He's just a little strange, or, you know, you'd have to call him. He's two hours. I got Yeah, that's kind of a story I can tell you right now, too. He's two hours outside London, so in order to interview with him, you got to drive to his studio. So it's a drive, you know, it's, and, but you got to call him that morning to remind him you're coming because he'll forget. He'll just not be there, or he'll be playing with a microphone, or he'll be off with the fairies. I mean, that's Miles. It's just you got to do it. But the one thing that um, the one thing that let me know in my gut that that end times were near is when he hooked up with Christine Hart. I have no idea where that woman came from in terms of her association with Miles. Um, she. She just always gave me a really bad feeling. I'm just saying this is very subjective, guys. This is my opinion. I'm not trying to troll her. But I will tell you that uh, she came out of nowhere, and I don't really know what that was all about. And it's kind of still there. She actually didn't come out of nowhere. She's actually yeah. been embedded in the at least some level of mainstream media in the UK yeah. for quite a while. Oh, that's true. She and has, she has connections off. to the BBC, which triangulates to Miles' background. Yep. And yep. I do believe her story. She basically was called into a mind control op operation, as she seems to me to be a monarch-type person. Yeah, yeah. But she says she is now, doesn't she? Has she had... I think she's kind of dead. Yeah, I think she's kind of cop to that. You know, the problem is, <clears throat> the problem with all of this is that until you clear yourself, yeah. you really shouldn't be out in the media. Right. And I can say that because I know dozens of people out of projects. And I know what they've gone through to heal, to be in a place yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. where they can, they can intersect with people in a meaningful way and not become another vector of control. Right, right. But I so suspect that a lot of these people are embedded there for a reason because they for are... For a reason, exactly, for a reason. Um, she, it was really interesting because the last time I did an interview with Miles Basis, 45 point, part four, Yashka and I were driving back from his house to London Maybe halfway there. It's a couple hour drive, and all of a sudden he starts texting me furiously. Miles, you got to go on Christine Hart's show tonight. My, Miles, I'm in the car, man. I'm in the car. You got to go on the show. The show's in 45 minutes. No, Miles, I'm in the car. Silence. No, you really need to go on her. Like somebody was hammering on him. You know what I mean? You need to be on her show tonight. And I'm thinking, that's it. That's it. That's just coming from somewhere. And I was like, nope. She can make an appointment with me on a Thursday, whatever. That's fine. I'm really busy. Um, probably be summer before I can do that. But, you know, we can set something up. No, it has to be tonight. It has to be tonight. Never heard from her again. Why did she want me right then and there? Do you know what I mean? And why was she making Miles just hammer me? 
I don't know. From that moment on, it was like, yeah, there's something really not okay going on here. And then, and, and I don't know what it was, but I do know that I pulled out of the, I pulled out of that conference because she was bringing Channel Four and the BBC in. Yeah. How stupid do you think I am? Well, there's a lot of triangulation that's going on with Christine Hart. Yeah. One is that she was pulled into Revolution Radio by Douglas Dietrich. Yeah. Has a connection to Michael Aquino. Right. You can't deny that. I mean, yeah. however much Douglas Dietrich wants to backpedal on this, he is connected to Michael Aquino. Michael right. Aquino seems to loom in the background with Max Spears' death, as does Stuart Swerdlow. Who I consider to be the Dark Lord of MK Ultra. Quite I know you said that. <laughs> no, he is. Um, you know, I and know. I've crossed paths with the Swordlows before. They're not mm -hmm. nice people. Yeah. I was on a network with him. I avoided him like the plague. And I don't really give a crap because I'm not saying anything out of class here. I've already right. said all this stuff. So okay. there's a lot of triangulation. That particular radio network, I have no problem saying this because I've already proved it. That particular radio network is an op. It was yeah. put there to pull people in, yeah. audiences, hosts, and to do harvesting. That's yeah, what yeah, it's yeah. there for. So, you know. Yeah, the Satanists are. Uh, do you feel like the Satanists are coming, becoming more visible in terms of the alternative community as well? I do, yeah. and yeah. here's one of the reasons I think so. There's a huge rumor. Um, and it's just a rumor. I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but, there, but it has been going around for a very long time that there's a very famous actor in, that, who heads the Church of Satan in Los Angeles. He's a funny man, um, and I recently saw him pictured with David Icke and Icke's son, and I thought, oh, look at that. Isn't that interesting? Because Satanism just is, I don't know, popping up everywhere. Anyway, yeah. so that's you've got Aquino, you've got Christine Hart, you've got, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You, you, it's just. Well, you know, if the, the problem isn't that, look, Miles wasn't, this isn't his first rodeo either. He's been around the block a few times. Yep. He has. And I've given him, for whatever it's worth, because I don't think he cares what I think. I mean, it was like Kerry Cassidy and Project Camelot. I gave him a lot of latitude before I finally said, you know what? I watched what you did with former White Hat. I watched how you promoted this guy. I watched how this blog reached out and began attacking a lot of my friends, and I watched one of my friends die as a result of this. Right. So at that point, all doubts are laid aside, and I just go, okay, you're dark. Mm -hmm. And with Miles, if, if Miles is innocent, then his discernment is so poor that he shouldn't even be in journalism because journalism is a game of discernment, gut instinct. It does as far less to do with facts than it does having the instinct to know which corner to turn. Yeah, I it's think that um, one of the things I've seen when uh, back in the day when uh, Miles was interviewing Angela Power Disney, she mentioned that when uh, Miles would interview herself or another woman who had that sort of past and mind control and, uh, and um, conditioning that he would get triggered. And she actually said that on camera several times. Miles, we're triggering you, aren't we? And he'd say, yeah. So, you know, you just don't. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a blender out there. It's a minefield out there. It's, I don't know. It's really, uh, uh, it's really difficult right now. And that's why I think it's very, very important to identify your work and continue with your work for continue yeah. forward with your work. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, all of the work that I've done on the Fae and for me, it is such an exciting thing. It's such an exciting thing, and yet it's such a huge mystery because, um, you know, all of the little episodes, or even you might even call them courses at this meal that's mm. going to end up being the workbook, they're all knit together around something. They're all knit together around something that, you know, we're going to uncover what's at the it, – it's like a wide net that's been cast. But each bit is so – each bit is so hard to digest or huge or revelatory or explosive 
that it has to come out one bit at a time, and we can look at each bit. The false history and the fae are so connected. Absolutely. They're so, yeah. so connected. And the more I work on it, the more I, I get how they're connected. But I can't, I don't dare really connect them up firmly yet, because too many people don't have the peace yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, what you're doing right now is you're reverse engineering something. You know, we kind of, we have grown up in this counterculture thing, largely with Sitchin's work and the Anunnaki as being the legacy of humanity. Yeah. If they were blotted out, they were marginalized, they were placed into a position where they were this cute little pixie creature. You know, flitting around in a Walt Disney film. Right, right. A little bit. And <clears throat> we lost a part of ourselves as a result of that obscured history. Yeah. Forget for a minute screwing with the timelines and altering all of the other history that's gone on. We have a false narrative. Yeah. This concept of the Anunnaki and that we were nothing more than... Lulu's. Bread for gold mining, used as slaves, genetically altered, and driven across continents for purposes that aren't apparent. Right. I don't see the legacy of humanity that way. Right, right. So we have to uncover yeah. that. So, I mean, that's a huge job because of the footprint that that has in the consciousness right now. Right, right. And it does. Yeah, and it does. And, um, yeah, so... One of the things I always try to remember is that as many times as I tell this story, almost no one's heard it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I keep to telling the story, telling the story, traveling the world, telling the story, and thinking, oh, man, people must be getting tired of hearing this by now. And then I realize I just have, I've just started telling this story, and I've just started figuring this story out for, it's for a, a large part. You know, this thing that I put up in Facebook a couple of days ago that you kind of circled um, when you saw it was uh, great. It was brilliant. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the narrative, they were talking about the two Ahadu Danan, who absolutely figure into this fundamentally. And I can tell you what I what I think right now, knowing that it very well could change as it gets deeper. But um, well, first, give the backdrop because a lot of people yeah. aren't on it. So okay, yes, yeah, so we'll and what that was up. about. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Fay, as far as I can make out right now, go back to what is described as a battle. It's called the Battle of Moitura, also known as the First Battle. Absolutely, could be the case. They talk about, and you can see this for yourself, and I really recommend that you do look this fellow up. His name's Robin Williamson. He's a bard, and he recorded, it was about an, he told the story, the bardic, the bardic tale of the Battle of Moitura at Megalithomania 2009, and he recorded it. Please watch it. It's absolutely fundamental. It's a fundamental place to start, and you have to hear these things orally. That's how people, this is how people are. This is how we work. So, um... <clears throat> the tale very simply was that on the island that we now know as Ireland, we think, in the area of Sligo, a group of people came onto the land either from over the sea or under the sea, and these were called the Fomorans. Now, who those people actually are is really a deep subject. It could easily be the transition between Lemuria and Atlantis, if you think about it, water to land. Uh, I mean, there's so many things that you can, so many ways that you can go with this. There were a people already there, supposedly. I have not sussed that out, who they were, why they were there, or if they're even real. They were called the Fir Bolg, F-I-R-B-O-L-G. I'm not so sure they were there. Anyway. The Tuahadzidanan was another people who came from supposedly, well, across the water, supposedly from, they've said Denmark, they've said Finland, they've said Switzerland. I think Switzerland's probably a good, a good um, guess, but um, they are the people of Dana. They are the people of the Danube. They are, the, you know, they come from wherever the Danube source is, I think, right now. Um, and they met 
and they met on what we call the Ireland the 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 island of Ireland now, and they did battle in a very supposedly in a very stylized way. And I have to tell you, Randy, when they talk about in these tales the way they did battle. They had to have exactly the same number of people on one side as they had on the other, and it was very stylized. Do you know what I mean? I have a memory of that. I don't know. Help me with this. Is this something that we knew when we were children, and then, and then all of the wars and the overwhelming of one army with another, another, you know, being outnumbered and all that stuff just sort of drove that from us? Or was there a time in this, in this here and now, where that were, that was the rules of engagement, where it was, it had to be even and even on each side? Yeah, it was called a tug of war. Remember yeah, when you were okay. a kid and you played a tug of war? Okay, so yeah. that's kind of a pantomime. It's kind of a but you would have even teams. And the idea was balancing between the different strengths of two sides, mm -hmm. given, let's say you have five people on each side, the average strength, but you would be surprised to find out sometimes that the team with the 95 pound weakling, that would have been me back in, in you know, sixth grade, <laughs> would sometimes win tug of war just because of the will that was involved with it. So isn't that an interesting thing? And chess. Look at chess. Look at the yeah. chess board. Yeah. They make a very, very, they go over that territory quite a bit in these tales of the war, of, of this engagement, that there was an even on this side, an even number on this side. Okay. Now, one of the things I want us to remember when we're talking about this is that we come across the water from England or even from Norway, really. Um, on a ferry, do we not? We go mm -hmm. on a ferry. a ferry. Yeah. From one land to Ireland, we take a ferry. Okay. There, I mean, this is just it's 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 just the etymology and the wordplay that you put into this. And folks, you know, that's one of the reasons why you need to get Kara's workbook, episodes. The Fay. You is the Fay. Yeah. But I have to say, that's not really, I got, even though I continued that because it set me on fire and I wanted to, it didn't come from me. That came from a German fellow called Erhard Landmann. Mm -hmm. Erhard Landmann works in, um, he doesn't work, he lives in Germany and uh, he's very ill now. He's been working on this from since the early 70s, He, but he's somebody who, he was an IT specialist, I think, working for Siemens many, many decades ago. And he's one of those those people who will sit down with something and just not let go of it. And he'll see the play in words, you know, sort of a John Nash character, really. He'll see the play in words, and he'll see the patterns in words. And he started to see these patterns, and he wrote about it. And then he started to talk about it, and everybody ignored him. And they treated him like a fool and mm. all of those sorts of things. But the etymology that leads us back to understanding that there is evidence of plenty on this planet that the Fey were our seed race. Etymological research is accepted, scientific research into cultural origins. It is, you know, you make yourself happy with the science behind this because that etymology is an absolutely accepted way to look into this stuff. Anyway, the Tuahada Danon, where was I with that, that we started on explaining that? Even sides, yeah. the battle, do we remember uh, yeah. this? Go, no. yeah. Okay, now... I always, I do, generally speaking, try to tell the personal side of this, even though, I mean, some people, like, some people, that's what they they resonate with, and some people just want to hear the other stuff. But, you know, for me, it was like I'd been waiting for a very long time for all the tumblers to twirl and the things to fall into place, so I could go, ah, yeah, yeah. this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my life, isn't it? This is why I'm here. This is why I'm here. Okay. Um, I, I think I've said to you before, I've talked about the temple burning and that being a mystery school and all Ephesus, of that. Ephesus. Yes, yeah. this, is what, this is where it started for me when my yes. house on Temple Street burned, right? And the door to Ephesus opened. And what's the middle three letters of that word? P-H-E. P, -E. P yep. Fe. It's Fe. And that word, if you take it apart, means I come from the Fe. 
okay? The door to Ephesus opens. Anyway, um, I know we were going somewhere with this, though. We were talking about the Chuaha de Danon um, <clears throat> and fairies and all of that. It's not what you think it is, and it has been buried, and I, I'm hoping very hard that uh, what I suspect to true, be true will be true, and that the Tuaha de Danon will end up being the Atlanteans, and that there were survivors of Atlantis, uh, and probably still are, frankly, um, alive on this planet, working on this planet just a few centuries ago. Just a few centuries ago. That's now. See, that's Sylvia Ivanova's work on New mm -hmm. Earth. Have you checked yes. her out? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I've been oh, looking man. at that. Yep. She's doing some amazing work. And if you do check that out, start with number one. Don't. Start, I've had people go. Oh, I started with number fifty, and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> start with number one, man. <laughs> no, it's sequential, dummy. <laughs> Start with number one yeah. so you can see what's going on with this. Okay, so this is the work, though, that – and and this is the thing. I mean, I've been watching um, Chanter's old stuff, and he, he thinks my Faye work is funny. So it cracks him up. So I, I – I, I, They do because, I mean, because that's, the, that's the stereotype right now. See, we, we don't have a warrior image right now of the Faye. This is very troubling. You know, we don't have an image at all. And that was one of the things I was going to ask you. Yeah. Where do we find the place where we begin to resurrect this imagery to bring it back to its state? Because what do we got? We got fucking Tinkerbell. I mean, yeah, exactly. really, this is the best we can do. Exactly. Well, this is one of the reasons I want to talk to Swagger so badly. Yeah. Because even though I don't think we're going to agree on everything, and that's fine. He has done a lifetime's worth of work. He's he's really recognized as one of the uh, foremost researchers on these folk on this folklore in Ireland. Okay, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I did realize pretty pretty early on is that they're very attached to not not swagger necessarily, but people who do uh, resonate with these stories in Ireland or who are Gaelic and resonate resonate with these stories are exceptionally attached to them. I did. Um, I rolled out the Fay lecture, the first Fay lecture in Byron Bay, um, and there were people there who had been working with the elementals all their life who were very stunned and taken aback by what I was saying because it wasn't what they thought I was going to talk about. I wasn't going to talk about Didn't we go there the first time we talked about this as well? Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about up. the little skeletons that people yeah. are finding in jars with, you know, wings attached and stuff like that. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about a mighty people. And um, what was it they called them in? I think they called them the gentle folk. I mean, these are uh, elegant um Tall, ethereal, <laughs> magical, yeah. original beings. Come on, these are not. This is not Walt Disney, and they they developed. I mean, this is another story that goes way, way back. They developed the ability to miss themselves, meaning cloak themselves from our sight. This mist, right? One of my very all-time favorite. Prayers. Uh, there's a couple things I got to tell you about that, though. Is the Fade Fiata cry of the deer? It was stolen by the Catholic Church and turned into St. Patrick's breastplate or the Lorica, but it's not. It's the Fay. It's the prayer of the Fay. And in Sligo, near Sligo, there's this place called Tara, this hill where they had their battle. And the prayer goes at Tara today, in this fateful hour, I call on heaven with its power. The earth with all its darkness, you know, the lightning with its rapid wrath. I mean, it's just all about invoking everything that, that's alive in the earth and placing them in the end of the, the end of the prayer says, I, all these, all these I place with God's almighty help and grace, although that's probably the Catholic church there, um, between me and the powers of darkness. Okay. Now, that was their prayer. It's the Fade Fiada, F A E D H, Fiada, the cry of the deer. Okay. 
I have to tell you a personal story. I had a friend whose daughter um, had a life-threatening illness about a year and a half ago, and I, I, I was sending her messages, one of which was the fact that her father is a blacksmith. She, they live here where I am right now. Anyway, her father was a blacksmith, and I said to her, you know, your father has been teaching you all of your life that what happens when you heat iron up, iron, of course, way past its tolerance, what happens? And then what happens when it cools down? You've made something completely new, right? Mm -hmm. And the iron has everything to do with the fae, right? And I said, um, and I'm going to give you this prayer to take into the hospital with you. And so she, she took it with her, and she said it all the time. And she ended up, she's fine now. She had a, she had a, she had a, had to have her bone marrow transplanted. She had mm -hmm. a, is it pernicious anemia? It's aplastic mm -hmm. anemia. That's mm -hmm. what it was. Yeah. And um, you know what her name is? Ready? Dana. Her name is Dana. And I just realized not too long ago that these, this, that, that all goes together. I told her that not too long ago. I said, guess what, Dane? Guess what? You know that prayer I taught you? <laughs> it belongs to the people of Dana, man. So, um, but my, 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 not difficulty, but challenge right now is to, um, my challenge right now is to find a way, Randy, to describe the dual, the polar, not dual. I don't like to say dual because that's something else altogether. Duality is not who we are. We're polar. Right. The polar nature of the Fae, as far as I can make out, is that they are without and within. I believe that they're still existent in a material way, intradimensional, inter interdimensional and try anyway but I also believe they married themselves to the planet in a way that we just don't quite understand anymore they became at one with this planet in a way when they say the faith faded into the mist when they say that they can they can come back out when they want to I'm not sure so sure that I'm not so sure that that it's that sort of um, everyday kind of thing anymore. I'm not sure, Randy. Maybe you know. So let me ask you this. Yeah. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The NeverEnding Story or not. I did. It wasn't one of my favorites, but I will say it was my children's favorite. It was my favorite, too. Oddly enough, it was one of my kids. But over the years, it's kind of been a touchstone for a lot of things. Yeah. But it seems to me the act of remembering, the act of bringing into focus and attention again mm -hmm. see this is why i think what you're doing right now in this this quest is so important because i think what you're doing you're stirring up a lot of the unconscious memory you are bringing back into remembrance right and in a sense those mists are the place where the fae receded to they are still there they're waiting for us to remember. They're waiting for us to pay attention. They're waiting to reemerge. They are. They are. Mystically, that's just kind of the way I see it. Interestingly enough, though, it's not in the same way as, say, someone like um, Stephen Greer will say, you have to invite the alien into your heart. It's <sighs> not like that. The fate are the fate don't get. I'd rather you didn't use that comparison yeah, because there's so right. many things I could say about Stephen Greer, <laughs> yeah, but know. okay. But you know. they're very impassive. They're they're very mm -hmm. impassive about us. It's like they're observers. You know what I mean? They're observing us. They're connected with. What was it? Um, Greg Carlwood came up with this this the other night, and I thought it was really good. They care about the apple tree, knowing the apples will be okay if they tend the tree. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But they're observing us because we're their seeds. Yeah. We're their children. Yeah. We are their children. They talk about fairies stealing their children. They talk about whatever that actually means. Um, you know, fetus is F-E, right? I mean, away with the fairies is probably something that you know, not what we think it is, that kind of thing. But um, they're interesting in their, in the sense that I think that they're um, impervious in a way. You know, 
most spirit, most teachers on the other side of the threshold, when they, when someone is seen, I don't know how to say this. You help me if it's screwy, but when someone is seen, when someone appears to say a clairvoyant initiate from the other side, they're often um, new, cause so completely neutral and so still. Do you know? This is sort of the um, gesture and stance of a of a master of a teacher, a master teacher. Mm -hmm. I see them when they look at us as sort of being that way. This is um, several notches above what what we're used to encountering or thinking about or uh, in a conscious level. And I think I see my my oldest son. I have to say to you because this this kind of goes to this kind of goes to this. We moved around a lot moved around a lot when he was growing up and one day I said to him if somebody were to ask you where you were from what would you say and you know what he said he said mom I'm just an observer right it's yeah. like that you know it's like that they're here to care for the apple tree the apples will be cared for but they are so they have this original Oh, what would you call it? Flame, I suppose. This original flame. This they are. They are our. They are our ancestors. They are our ancestors. They made decisions to become at one with the earth. God knows how many. God knows when that was. You know, it could have been five minutes ago. It could have been five hundred million millennia. I don't, I don't know. It's timeless. Yes. Yeah. They are very, they are very, very, they're married to the planet. The planet is a spirit. The planet is alive. Mm -hmm. The planet is mostly water. I'm, this is, I'm going I'm to get off on, a, on my, one of my favorite tangents now. The planet is mostly water. Water is where the mem our memories are. The water in the planet is where the planet holds her memories. That's why fracking exists. That's why, that's why there's such an, a black effort to destroy water. Yes, yes. We are war on water. It's what is Standing Rock about right now? Exactly. It, it's about we the war are, yeah, of the. Hopi have arrived. <gasps> Did you see that the Hopi have arrived? I mean, the shiver went this, down my back. I don't think people realize how monumental this is. We have tribes that haven't spoken to each other in a century. You know, the yeah. Crow going in and speaking to the Lakota, and the fact that we are dealing with water versus versus this 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 oil economy that that so needs to go away now right right and it's right. the native people and you know i just posted this on the facebook as of today which is the 21st of september mm -hmm. uh, the lakota leader has gone to geneva to the human okay. rights organization of the un to address that, that. Was a prophecy wasn't it when all the tribes came together it is a prophecy them. and i don't think That's people understand prophecy. This is the act of war that we've been looking for, but it's not a war like we've imagined. This is the shot that's now being heard around the world. It is the native, the indigenous yeah. people rising up exactly. and the spirit behind that. Exactly. Yeah. And the Hopi prophecies are so powerful that there's a, it, you can find it on Facebook pretty easily. You could, when they arrived in that camp and were filmed coming into that camp, I thought, oh man, you know? Oh, man. <laughs> There's a lot going on behind this. I mean, this is more than just a piece of ground, and it's more than just water rights versus right. pipelines. Um, right. the, future of our, the future of our actual existence here is at stake because we're behind the scenes right now, there is a promise that was left to these people, and that promise was that they would birth free energy for all the people of the earth. And that right, was bequeathed, right. that was bequeathed to them by Russell Means, and I have been in contact with spokesmen for Russell Means yeah. State. This is very important because this is an opportunity right now for the Native people to break the culture of toxicity that we've had, to break it for good, and move us into this. Amazing. Field. 
Yep, it's amazing. No, I really diverged on that one, but that's that's important to to say. In that's the okay. Because it actually reminded me of something. You know, everywhere I go, I'm doing research on this stuff. It's it's in my face all the time. And we were just in Frankfurt, and Yashka took me to the top of a mountain, and it was uh, the mountain represents Brunhild, and um, supposedly this mountain is where Siegfried found Brunhild and woke her up, and um, um, what was her name? Hildegard of Bingen made a, a pilgrimage to this mountain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right on top of this mountain, though, in the 30s, the Nazis planted a radio tower to change the frequency. It's still there. It's still broadcasting. You know, it's one of those stations that 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 people that people would put. Um, Cities would put on hills so that they could broadcast their radio shows. Do you remember, mm -hmm. What do they call those? A re re transceiver? Is it, what, I mean, that's so long ago, I can't even remember what they're called. Anyway, <clears throat> on the side of the building, it says it's written Siegfried. The building is freaking written Siegfried on the side of the building. The mountain is Brunhilde. Okay, so you see how the – this is – the one thing I guess I haven't said about the Fae that I probably should say is that – all of the metaphors and all of the tales that you have of women in white or women who appear and disappear all the way up to Mary, sightings of Mary, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was the Catholic Church stealing. These are the Fae. This is a – this is a um, – God, I hate to do this. This is – this is a, a, a goddess kind of thing. And when I yeah. say that – I, I try to be very, very careful because it's really just now that the sacred masculine is also starting to be, to be you know, resurrected. That's not, so, so when I say things like that, <clears throat> I try to be very careful not to, you know, fall back into these, um, these patterns of making everything about just the female. Right. But, but these women, you will you will find these tales everywhere. Sorceresses, uh, fetillero, I think is what they're called in uh, Portuguese or Spain. Um, women in white, sightings of Mary. I mean, this is everywhere. So when I say Brunhilde, the mountain is Brunhilde. This is the ring cycle that Wagner put together. Right, very important. Yes, yes, very and much. Yeah. Dabbing the top of it with a phallic symbol. And mm -hmm. calling it Siegfried and changing the resonance frequency of that mountain, and this happens all over the place. It's n it's not just as Maria Wheatley will say, putting a church, landing a church on top of a ley line, which is all over the world as well. Yeah, it is. You know, the fair the fae were the protectors of the ley lines as well. The ley lines are being massively destroyed. Uh, CERN sits right on top of one of the most important ley lines on the planet, and it's Maria will say these the ley lines are just being mangled right now. And if anything brings the Fey back to our consciousness, it's going to be that. I think that's one of the reasons that they're coming. You know, they're trying to. Um, that, I, 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 look, we need an intervention. We need a champion. We are being bombed with the MF. We are being chemtrailed. We are being, you know. Yeah. Genetically altered, and ultimately they would like to put up, you know, uh, the space fence and enclose us so that they can inhabit us with nanobots and create this perfect AI singularity thing. It, what right. better foil for that than the champions of the original nature, the original people, to revive right. the spirit of what humanity really is? That's right. That's right. And frankly, that's why, I mean, I know several people who self-identify as Draco, and they won't be in the same room with me. The only one who would was Harold. But I think that was an assignment, to be honest. Know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But, like Simon Parks won't be on the same stage with me every time he finds out if I'm on. Every time he finds out I've been invited, he fails. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, stuff like that, no. you know, it's stuff like that. Why would, and I said, this is something I said to Maria, why, of course, why would a Draco want to be in the same room with the Fae? This couldn't be as far, you know, this couldn't be as farther away from each other, you know, if you planned it. So, 
Yes, what better than what better than the Fae? And the real and the best thing about that is they're only here to awaken the Fae within all of us. We will be our own savior in that way. It is yeah. not savior programming. No, it no, it's not. I, I use the term champion, which is a completely different meaning. Because ultimately it was back to the beginning of this conversation. We have to be responsible. Yeah. We, we are responsible for reclaiming our past and taking a hold of our future and ensuring that our generations continue on a world that's worth living in and not some uh, biological cage. Right. Now, the, I think the person who, who visually wrote the best about this was Tolkien. If yep. you want an idea of what the Fae are, if the Fae are Tolkien wrote about them. Yeah. He absolutely wrote about them. So, um, yeah. And the reason also, <clears throat> when you're when you're thinking about the transhumanism that could engulf us, that is uh, all around us all the time. Remember, think about the full spectrum assault that has been required just to get us this far. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. How mighty are we, Randy? That they have to that they have to go to these lengths to try to capture us. I mean, really. I, so yeah. So anyway, it's uh, it's quite the um, it's quite the labor of love, and um, I feel really uh, I feel really like I have to stay on track to get the Fay going, no matter what gets thrown at us, right? So how long do you perceive it'll be until um, the next chapter? episode? Yeah, the next episode. Oh, well, I was going to write the next uh, episode about um, what it is that really sustains us. Mm -hmm. Because we are beings of light and not food. Yes, yes. that's, food that's being exactly what right. Food being has ever been run on us. How do you like that? I really think that. I think uh, very much that... Um, that, yeah, that, that if, if people knew the truth about food and about uh, breatharianism and about us taking light into our body, if people really knew the truth about that, everything, all that's, everything that's bad in the world would fall. It would all fall. Yeah. I think that's fundamental. That should be my next one. I am ever expanding on the Fae. There's probably going to be a whole book on, uh, there'll, there'll end up being a, a full book on that. Right now, that's coming at me so fast and furious that I'm going to end up writing a whole book on it, and I will be collecting up all the conversations that I have. People like yourself, people like Randy, um, or people like James. They will. They. There was a fellow in um, Australia, um, Dan Schreiber. Do you know him? I don't. You know. should know Dan Schreiber. He runs Starseed. That's his thing, and he's actually South African. There's a mountain down there called Fay Mountain. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I, oh, I got, got chills. I got chills. I got to interview them because they took me away before I had a chance to really. And also, it's Aboriginal territory, and Aborigines are still in dream time. They're not ever going to come out of dream time. They're going to fade into the right. distance, I'm afraid. Um, but there are a lot of Aborigines around Starseed. And um, I was there for maybe two hours when I realized that time, there was something different about time down there. Like I could get about 20 minutes worth of it into one minute without realizing it, you know? I'd go, wow, what the hell's happening here? Time, what's wrong? What's with time down here? I brought that to Dan Schreiber, and he said, he said, because the place where time starts is right over that mountain. That's where time begins. And it's about to reset itself. And yet, I didn't get a chance to finish these conversations with this guy. So I'm going to get him on my show. I, I would like to have him be the first person on my show. His name is Dan Schreiber. And I, Dan, Randy, you got you got to interview this guy. I need to talk to some of these people. I know I need to talk to Marina Whitley uh, as well. Maria? I mean, mm -hmm. Wheatley, I'm sorry. Um, there's so many interesting people out there. And this is a conversation that I think is... It's in process, you know, you seem to be at the center of something right now that creatively so. wants to be birthed. It wants to I be birthed. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see why that troll wanted to keep me away from Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, that was job one to keep me away from, from, and to do this black dance of death while I was on stage at Starstade was, was, you know, absolutely necessary. But that is where, according to Dan Schreiber, the Aborigines say time begins. It begins there and it, it resets itself every, I don't even remember what he said. It wasn't a platonic year, though. It was more like, I mean, it was something like 56,000 years or something like that. I expected him to say, you know, the platonic year, but it, that wasn't it. It's something else altogether. And he said, time begins over there. And right there, that's Bay Mountain. And I went, no, come on, come on on and he had come down to Melbourne to see my uh, I'd done chemtrails in Melbourne and I had talked about FE being the symbol of Faye and also the symbol of iron and how important that is mm -hmm. to um, iron is really important to fairy lore but one of the things I had said in the chemical in the chemtrail lecture was that strontium is a bone marrow seeker it goes after our red and white blood cells it destroys the red blood cells and so this guy <laughs> Up goes the hand, you know. He was just channeling everything. Yes, what? Well, you know, I'm thinking you were talking about FE and how that's the iron symbol. And then last night in Melbourne, you said that strontium was an iron seeker. You see how these are all coming together? Mm -hmm. yeah. They're after the iron in our blood. The after they're after the FE in our blood. Are they not? Yeah. Randy. The. I mean, come on. Well, we're reverse engineering what, look, there's a reason why they're doing all this stuff. And yeah. Lure is coming back now to decode all this. It's more powerful than the black magic that they're spinning right now. It is. Absolutely it is. So, yes, I recommend you get a hold of Dan Schreiber. I'll hook you guys up. Okay, good. Okay? Excellent. I'll Excellent. hook you guys up. He does a lot of traveling. He's, uh, but... Uh, but he's a pretty great. He's a pretty great guy. So, and he's hooked up to the Aborigines as well, which is also very interesting too. You know. Um, so, so, what else do you want to talk about, Bud? Well, Her? that's what I was going to ask you. If there was anything else we wanted to talk about, I, and we could have three different conversations. I need to get up tomorrow morning and drive to Philadelphia. So. You do. Okay, don't. Yeah. We won't keep this going very much longer. But the one thing, and you can edit this out if you think that you need to, Randy. But I've said. And I said this on 13, but you didn't see it, so you don't know yet. I don't um, I've, got a, uh, I've got a PayPal donation button up. Okay. And that's because I'm. This is unpaid leave till January, and we need um, we need donations. Um, this is a massive medical situation. So it's if you think this is inappropriate and uh, edit, edit it out, that's fine. No, but it's I am, not. I'm mentioning I'm mentioning it on everybody's show that I go on. And it is World Lectures, all lowercase one word, at AOL.com. That's the PayPal link. Please donate if you can. As you know, I work for a living. I don't rely on donations. Yeah. Right now I'm finding myself in a position I've never been in. And I've got to, I've got, this is where I need to be right now. And I will continue to work and I will continue to bless the situation because it's given me time which is the one thing that happens. It's given me time to work on these kinds of things. It's also serious business. This is what it is yeah. right now. So, um, Very serious. I am going to say that. And, uh, uh, and no, just, I have no problem with that at all. Okay. I, I look, we put it right. out there. We, we send energy out. We have the right yeah. to harvest back. That's and right. people That's need to right. learn to give because there's circularity to giving. Anyway, so not to be a giant pain, but that's what it is right now. So I am definitely put the, putting that out there. And we've had some responses, and that's very encouraging. It's very encouraging to me. Also, Hard True, go to my YouTube channel, please. If I get 25,000 subscribers, I can use the YouTube studios in London, yes. not too far from where I live. Yeah, you can. I do that. All right, because I can, I can, I mean, anything that we can use. Yes. About. So please subscribe to the channel. Please subscribe to Randy's channel. Remember, Randy and I are back to back right now. He's a guy. He's somebody you can trust. So I know I do. Thanks. And um, I've got Terry on Friday as well. Terry Joyce. Yes. Yep. Yep. And who do I have on Saturday? I've got somebody on Saturday too. I'm just interviewing like crazy. Ah, 
um, Zany Mystic. You know that show? I do. Yes. Zany Mystic is Lance Zany White. Is. Yes. Yeah. So I'm Great interviewing show. like crazy this week. Yeah. 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 All right. So what say else? Write a CW Chanter for me, and um, I will. Um, I'm so looking forward to that. I told him, you better not tear me a new one either. And he said, I'll be on my best <laughs> Well, I don't think he knows who he's messing with because you could be a rather formidable, formidable foe yourself. I think I've he knows seen that. You. I've seen I think that. He knows that. Let's pull him in, though, because he's a good guy, and I think he's got a lot to offer. Tell, anyway, people, right. tell people again where they can find you. Don't forget your, oh, yeah. your, your oh, online presence, yeah. your website. Yeah, I've got Kara St. Louis on Facebook. I've got a magazine, VortexCourage.me, one word, www.VortexCourage.me. That's my online magazine. I've got books out. Please interact with the material. I'm yeah. not writing this stuff to listen to my self-talk. It's really, really important. The Sun Thief, Dangerous Imagination, Silent Simulation. And we've got a couple of episodes out on the workbook. One is the false chronology. That's a really tough one to, um, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance that goes with that. I'm working on that. I'm working on that in my essay show called 13. We're breaking that down a little bit because we, we need to. So people can, can, grab, can grab that. And then um, the very beginning of the Fay is uh, episode two. Get into that one. Realize that I'm working hard on that one. There will be more material. But don't wait because I'll tell you what. By the time the workbook is put together in the next year or 18 months, it's going to be 600 pages long. And I do not recommend that you encounter no, all of it. No, I don't either. No, 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 no. One bit at a time. One course at a time. And Randy said it. I mean, no one has ever said that to me, but he's absolutely right. We're reverse engineering this. We're reverse engineering this, but you know what? It's kind of a race because they're using the same um, the same tools that to to close the holes that we're using to reverse engineer it. So you got to get out there. You got to get into the fray. You got to get yourself started. Okay so that you can help yourself and help other people. Um, and then I've got a, God, Randy, I've gone bananas. I've got a YouTube channel, Hard True, mm -hmm. with a little essay program on it called 13, and I'm getting ready to put my little toe back in the water on the radio show uh, circuit with Capricorn Radio. Capricorn Radio, James and Swagger's Swagger. network. Yes. Yep, in the United States, that'll be every Saturday at 11. Probably see Mr. Randy on there eventually. You will. You will. Uh, you will. Yeah. But I mean, on my show, too. Yeah. Yeah, your yeah. show and my show. I'll have you on my show. Uh, <laughs> we'll, just, yeah. we'll just go next door and have a cup of coffee. Mr. Randy, it cares. What, let's have some coffee. Um, and I yeah. think that's it. And also, please donate. Uh, World Lectures at AOL.com on PayPal. World Lectures at AOL.com. And we'll put yeah. all of these links, all of the stuff about care up, and we will nag you Thank ruthlessly, you. read Thank the you. books, study the material, watch yeah. the videos, yeah. because this is unveiling am, before your eyes. It is. it is. I am open to comments, by the way, on my YouTube channel. But what I've said is if you are a bore or a troll. You know, you're going to live to regret this, kick I can tell you. Right <laughs> I will kick your ass right off there. If you have something constructive to say, do it. I'm all ears. Yeah. But I have only had to kick one person off so far. And so what I've said is it's something like 0.0079% of my viewership has had to be kicked out, which is actually really great. Cause That's it's really good, like yeah. Thing. It's almost like saying my kitchen floor is clean enough to eat off of. You know, <laughs> know what I mean? That's awesome. You know what I mean? So yeah, anyway, yeah. if you have something to say, say it, please. But don't be a bore and don't be a troll. That's right. I'd say, Randy and I have no patience for this crap anymore. Zero Here, tolerance. Get the hell out of our way and let us exactly. do our work. Yep. We'll be our partners in our in our work. Right? Exactly. Right? Yes. All right, my man. Kara, it's been awesome. Uh, I'm not sure what this interview is about, but we got through Me it and either. we did some amazing work. And I'm we sure when we it. play it back, we're going to remember all kinds of things we never thought we said before because we always it's do. About, you know what it's about, Randy? It's about the craziness that it's we're fun. in right now. Yeah. It's crazy. It's about keeping our head above the water yep. right now. That's really what it's about. Yeah. This is yeah. all their psychotherapy, basically. <laughs> yes. We have to keep our head above yeah. water and tread water. And do what we need to do until this settles down, yep. until the pieces fall where they're going to fall. 
that's what this is about. Yeah. And a couple other things like 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 the super trolls that are out there, like, mm. like manipulation, like the crazy, crazy manipulation right now. The stuff falling to the ground and yeah. It's all gonna resolve. I we're heading into a different period of time and a lot of this is gonna resolve. We're in a we're in a period of discovery and we need to be tested and I yeah. think we come out the other side of this stronger for the next level of it. Yep. Here at St. Louis, I cannot thank you enough. You are my friend, my confidant, and... Uh, Randy, you keep me going, man. Half the time, it's like... Awesome, Randy. awesome. Randy. That's going to wrap it up for... That's going to wrap it up for this time, I think. Or otherwise, right, I'll get really embarrassed here. So. Now, listen. You go, so you, please go watch 13 and give me your comments. Go watch okay? 13. That's all 24 minutes. List. That's all it is, the first episode. Okay. And watch it all the way through so you can see what my wonderful artistic daughter did, okay? Okay. Awesome. Oh, creativity. Yes. Here's St. Louis. Thanks for coming on. I'm Randy Moggins. Hi, buddy. Love this, you. I love you, too, Bye. dear. This is Off Planet TV. Truth is out there. It's inside you. Good night. It's over there. Recording. <laughs> <laughs>